Good evening, and thank you all for coming. I knew it was going to be a good turnout, but wow. <laughs> and I want to especially to thank Ann Clayson, leader of New York Society for Ethical Culture, for her and the Society's generous hospitality in hosting this gathering to memorialize and celebrate Donna Markson. She also um, found some words in the um, ethical culture and humanist and secular canon that I'm going to lift right now um, before we get into the serious speaking. A, mem a memorial gathering is an act of loving leave-taking and a celebration of life. In the case of Donna's life, a joyous one. This gathering is for us who have loved and lost, who miss a wonderful woman, and who must go on living without her. Shakespeare wrote in Macbeth, give sorrow words, the grief that does not speak, whispers the o'erfraught heart and bids it break. Tonight, we will give sorrow words to help heal our broken hearts. Let's celebrate Donna. I have several people who have asked to speak, and number first of which is my uh, oldest son, David, and I'd like him to come up here now. Let's all keep them short. <laughs> if somebody wants it short, there's an awful lot of notes here. <laughs> Thanks for coming. I don't do sorrow. I'd rather do the celebration part of it um, because that's really what it should be all about. Um, and I was thinking about it that one of the, uh, I wouldn't call it an advantage, but for lack of a better word, one of the advantages of having a little bit of time uh, to think about what I wanted to say and what I wanted to do. And I was away last week and it hit me right away. Something that, was, that happened right there on the spot but also completely reflected something that was very much Donna and, uh, and something that she would appreciate. My wife likes art. We don't always like the same art, um, but it leads us into galleries and museums and, uh, and, and, and various shops and stores and the places where you go. So we're regularly being confronted by over-anxious art salesmen who want to get you to put something in your house, who want you to buy something and put it in your house. And the conversation starts simply, where are you from? What are you doing? What are you, what are you looking for? Do you know what style? But invariably, especially when you're trying to dismiss this person and get them to leave you alone so you could enjoy what's going, just walking around, They'll say, what color are you looking for? <laughs> okay, so that must be the secular humanist group and that must be the artist group, <laughs> right? Okay. What color are you looking for? Or even better, what color is your couch? <laughs> right? And that's when it hit me, we were away, and we got it again. What color are you looking for? And that's when it hit me. And that's the thing that I'm gonna remember about Donna and her seriousness to her craft and her seriousness to the art that she produced and the way that she saw the world and the way that she understood, the way that she battled with 
what art was supposed to be. Was it meant to be in your living room over your couch? Was it simply supposed to be enjoyed? And that's how I will remember her. I will remember her every single time I go into one of these stores and somebody says, what color are you looking for? And the only thing that I'll be able to think of is, boy, Donna would just rip this guy's lungs out <laughs> right now if she had heard that. So that is my story. That is my story with Donna. Obviously, there are more. Many of you have them. And I could reflect on a lot of other really wonderful things, but I won't step on anybody else's conversations and speeches. But to put, hopefully, everybody in a mood that says that's who she was, and that's what she would be like, and that is how I am going to remember her. Great. Who's next? <laughs> Um, Doug, are you ready? Um, Doug Shear and Donna worked together for many years running Artists Talk on Art, and Doug has asked to speak. Take it away. Uh, I, I've edited it down a little bit <laughs> for the sake of brevity. Um, I'm here to eulogize Donna on behalf of both the board of directors of ATOA and myself. I first got to know Donna when she began to attend our panels in the 1980s, and later she began to appear on them and plan them, and soon became a regular in the audience and a member at all the panel planning meetings. She really got involved in ATOA early on. So I had reached a substantial appreciation of her, so much so that when Vernita Nemec, who's sitting out in the audience tonight, uh, decided to step down as executive director after 10 years of doing it, I immediately walked across the gallery uh, to where Donna was standing and asked her if she would become the new executive director because I knew she was the next person. It was that obvious to me. And I was delighted that, and relieved by her answer that she would. She had already demonstrated many of the skills and more importantly, the temperament required uh, in order to succeed Vernita. Uh, and that was not gonna be an easy thing because Vernita was so well liked. So uh, for Donna, it was not only very enterprising to take it on, but also it was brave to take it on. Uh, and, you know, she came into a situation where we were practically broke and at her, with her efforts, uh, she started writing grants, she started to, uh, she, I found later on, uh, after, long after she was no longer director, literally hundreds of letters that she had written, many I knew nothing about. Very impressive what she had done on her own, of her own volition. Uh, so she really plunged in and helped us to survive. In fact, she innovated uh, what became our saving grace, which was auctions, since grants were drying up. And so she put together several of those auctions, and that was part and parcel of how we survived. But her optimism was coupled with her pragmatic get, thing done, get things done ethos. Uh, and uh, she had the ability, uncanny ability really, to, uh, to get the bankable names in the art world to appear on panels. So among her gets were Wolf Kahn, Jules Pfeiffer, Donald Cuspit, Mark Stevens, Elizabeth Murray, Dorothy Gillespie, Deborah Solomon, formerly of the New York Times, Faith Ringgold, John Alexander, and Calvin Tompkins. She was uh, an amazing organizer and moderator and unsurpassed in her preparation. Her often subversive ability to draw out even uncomfortable answers uh, and of course her always disarming charm. I, th I think that others will talk about her 60 year career as an international artist uh, but I, what I loved was 
uh, her ability to be self-deprecating. So for example, she often would refer to herself as a submerging artist, <laughs> which really is a wonderful way of looking at it. Uh, she was a natural entertainer. She, she was often the hostess for parties and meetings, and many, many of them on our, our behalf. And I, I still get a little breathless thinking about walking up those flights in the Broadway loft in Soho, uh, it, you know, especially if I was carrying something. Uh, the parties and dinners at the East Side apartment were a lot easier to deal with. And finally, let me say that I, re I literally live with Donna every day of my life. Why? Because sitting next to my desk in my home office uh, is a, a very tall and narrow painting by Donna. It's nine inches by 30 inches. It's an image of the Empire State Building it sort of glowing in the dark, looks a little bit like a, a 1930s Joseph Stella painting, but less abstract. And it has tattered edges on it. It's, it's just a magical, magical thing. So uh, that's what I think of when I think of Donna. Thank you. Um. Uh, to introduce the next speaker, uh, I got to tell you a little something uh, first. Um, he represents uh, the family that Donna married into in her first marriage. Um, one of the things about Donna was her, her marriage to Steve Doherty broke up amicably. They, no, no, no one hated each other, and uh, uh, but subsequently, the extended McCloskey, McDonald, Hackett clan in Vermont, New York, even as far as California, all decided we're not going to lose Donna, and they, a couple of them, literally told her, "We're not divorcing you," <laughs> and they kept her. And years later, when I came along, they took me in because of Donna. If Donna liked me, I was okay. And they brought me in. One of the people to, in that family to whom she was closest is Mark McDonald. And Mark, who is now a um, senator in the Vermont legislature and who's <laughs> who has been represented in the uh, newsletter of the Secular Humanist Society of New York a few times, uh, is here to talk about Donna from his perspective. Mark McDonald. Please. If I were home, this, this uh, Donna would have brought together half the, the, the people in my district. We have a... <laughs> a totally different scale. Um, when I first met Donna, she was married to Steve, and my folks were overseas. And I was living with my grandparents, and I was kind of in flux, and I found myself at least one night a week um, down at their place. And Donna, I'm, Donna was like a mom. Steve was my, uh, my mother's cousin. And when she came to our our, my grandparents, um, she took over Christmas. Um, and I, if I was going to just say one thing about Donna was there, you, you, whether it's in politics or people you know, there are things you just say, you can't do that. It can't be done. And the people that impress you are the people that prove that you're wrong. And there wasn't anything that Donna s set out to do that she didn't do well. And most of the things that she set out to do that I saw, you started out by saying, it can't be done and you can't do that. The first um, time she came to Christmas, she looked around at the Christmas tree, and the second time she came to Christmas, my grandparents, she brought a partridge in a pear tree. <laughs> the next year, um, I forget what the two is, but uh, for 12 years, she brought a crafted, 
thing for that Christmas. And um, there are a couple of them in the, uh, I think the partridge and the pear tree and the four calling birds, but there were lords of leaping and maids of milking and, and they were beautiful and, and just wonderful. And it kept my grandparents alive through the whole, the whole thing. Um, to keep it short, My family made all its own ornaments after they saw what Donna did. And my, when my daughter went to the, her prom, someone said, uh, are you going to get a dress? And she said, no, I'm going to make one. And I said, you can't do that. And so it's her, her friends. And um, someone said, well, threw her a, uh, a starburst wrapper and said, make one out of that. And she did. She made an entire dress, and it looked pretty damn good. And it was the picture of the, uh, of the prom. So Don always represented, in our family, small person, tiny, charming. And initially, when you first met her, for a minute and a half, she was dismissible. But she was not dismissible. And the room, t the room tonight is a testimony to... Um, her, that she had the same effect on you as she did on our family, and we were blessed by her presence. Thank you. Carl, do you want to say anything? Okay. Our videographer, award-winning videographer, I should say, is um, Karl Marxer, and if the name rings a bell, it's because he's Donna's cousin on her father's side of the family. Karl? Speak up. Well, thank you. I thought I would just tell a little family history that people may not know. Uh, I'm Donna's cousin. Her father, Bob, uh, Robert, was my grandfather's brother. They were born in Highland, Illinois, and considered St. Louis their home. Uh, my grandfather worked in offices uh, for a while. Would they, actually, what happened is Carl Lorenz Marx, or the same name as me, came to this country from Liechtenstein. Sedona was from Liechtenstein, uh, with a lot of Swiss influence. The wives mainly came from Liechtenstein. Uh, but he came to this country and started a farm. And he had the farm in Highland, Illinois, which close to St. Louis. And so my, there were seven children, four uh, daughters and three sons, who I don't know so well. My father knew them all. Uh, but uh, my grandfather got a job on the railroad and rode all around the country. He was a conductor so that he could survey land to find the best place in the country to have a farm. And he settled on Montgomery, Alabama. I can't even say Mont Montgomery properly because I have an accent and it's Montgomery. <laughs> but uh, he got the farm there and Bob, his brother, started the farm with him. And it lasted for a little while. They had some disagreements. <laughs> and I don't know what the disagreements were exactly, but uh, Bob then moved to Miami, started his family. Donna was the daughter. My dad stayed in touch with Donna a lot and would call her to uh, get advice on different things. Like I needed a camera. I was going to be a yearbook, I was a yearbook photographer. And he wanted to find out what camera to get for me. And after I moved up here, Donna's cleaning things out. She had the exact camera that I had. So I imagine she told him which camera that I should get. Um, but she was very uh, great with my mom. Uh, my mom retired and needed something to do and became an artist. And Donna advised her on things. She, my mom took trips all around the country to camps that, uh, for artists and learned how to Learned how to be an artist, kind of. <laughs> but she had shows and things like that. So she was very generous with my mom. And then I went to Savannah College of Art and Design. I had to get a master's degree to continue doing what I did. 
and one of my assignments was to interview a professional artist. <laughs> so I called my mom and she says, talk to Donna Marks or she'll help you out. And she did. So I wrote a whole report. And I was one of the few people in the class that actually interviewed somebody that didn't live in Savannah. <laughs> Which was kind of good to do. So she helped me moving up here. And I got involved with Secular Humanist Society and Rebecca Kelly Ballet, all, all because of Donna. So she was very generous to our family and uh, very, very helpful. We have great memories of Donna and really appreciate everything she did. Fellow artists, or I should say sororal artists, um, with Donna and two of her closest friends in the world, uh, Irene Christensen and, uh, and Lynn Mayacall. And the uh, podium is yours. I think, is, it, is this on? Can you hear me? Yes? Yes, yes. OK. Um, Irene and I realized that one of our traditions, we're missing one, and that is we shared birthdays because our birthdays were so close, but we need one more person who doesn't happen to be here, unfortunately, somebody who was an amazing person, a brilliant artist, and at one point got involved with butterflies. Anybody remember Donna and butterflies? I went nuts. I got her butterfly cards, I got her butterfly plates, I even got her a pair of butterfly wings. I don't know if they worked. <laughs> maybe yes, maybe no. Mm -hmm. Anyway, she was so much more than that to those of us who would go up and share an afternoon with her in her enormous loft uh, that was really uh, so substantial. We did not need to go to the gym afterwards when we got up those stairs. <laughs> Uh, and look at her incredible paintings, all of which were, well, the ones I remember the best were so tall, they were huge. And Donna really, I think, felt that she kind of came across as being short. I didn't think so. I thought she was just a little bit shorter than John, frankly. <laughs> what did you think? Uh, well, I, quite a bit. <laughs> <coughs> Did you want to say anything? I know what you're holding. You well, I'm holding, yeah. I'm holding something that Donna I'm and I. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm holding. Um, Donna was a very special friend of mine. I, I have difficulties talking about it. I know, her. I know, I know, I do too. But, no, but uh, I'm well. sorry. But we had, Donna and I had, uh, she was the founder of ERI. Artist in residence in the Everglades, and she was extremely important um, for Erie. It wouldn't have happened if it hadn't been for Donna. And she involved uh, Charles Myers and myself. We were the first artist in residence in the Everglades. And after that, things started taking off, and Donna and I became very close. We worked on uh, an exhibition. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, that of the artist who had been in the Everglades. It was a juried show that Donna and I juried. And the first place we exhibited that was in Oslo, in Norway, where I'm from. You hear that from my accent. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and, and John and Donna came. And uh, it was just a, a wonderful show with 28 artists uh, a U.S. artist who had been in the Everglades. And we had such a great time. And you know, I, I became close to John too when we were there. <laughs> so that was really, really nice also. And then, yes, and then after that, um, we, uh, the show went on to the Puffin Foundation in New Jersey. And uh, from there to the Tahave Center for the Arts in the Adirondacks. And finally, it went uh, back to, um, to uh, the Everglades, uh, the Co Ernest Cole Gallery um, at the parks, the Everglades Park headquarters. Um, 
And Donna's hope was that through art, it will bring public's attention to the worldwide environmental crisis. And um, I will always remember the years that I spent with Donna as a special friend. I know, mine too. You know, well, I, when Irene was speaking, it occurred to me that one of the things about Donna was when you became her friend, she brought you into every phase of her life. Mm -hmm. We were in Oslo, too, and I don't think we would have gone there if it hadn't been for Irene and Donna. I mean, it was just, I don't know, and I'm thinking, well, now what do I do? So I open my pocketbook, and there's a little, little picture of our dog, and it's the one Donna took. She knew that I was very into vitamins, and the little demi-tasse cup that I use every morning came from Donna. So I have a feeling that Donna's still gonna be in our lives every single day. Well, that is for sure. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Uh, about artists and residents in uh, Everglades, Alan Scott, is the um, park ranger in the Everglades. He's a, a biologist and he would have told you this, just to understand about Donna and the way she was for a moment. It was one morning at home, we were having our coffee in the morning and both reading the newspaper and she had one, she read the first section and the art section and that was it, everything else got thrown away. So uh, I'm reading politics someplace, and uh, I said, look at this. I said, uh, uh, Clinton, who was then president, I said, Clinton is uh, putting, uh, is asking for $8 billion to help out the national parks to upgrade and clean up and do things like that. And a couple of billion is just for the Everglades. And I handed over the paper and then forgot about it. She read the article, and by the end of that week, she had written to the governor of Florida, both senators from Florida, and a bunch of other people, and in the national park system. And of course, got nowhere. Um, but she, that didn't stop her. She kept writing, until finally, on one of the Senate committees, um, Senator Smith, uh, I hope I got his name right, Smith, of New Hampshire. Mark, might you remember? At any rate, the point is, uh, the senator from New Hampshire, no connection to the Everglades or to Florida, and a Republican. <laughs> wrote her back and followed up, he followed up with a phone call when she said, this is a great idea. And, uh, put her in touch with Alan, and there it went. That's, that was her. I don't know how many letters and phone calls she made, but she did, and she got what she wanted. She got a great program. And as I pointed out in the, in the, the notes up here, she was working on starting a second one at, uh, in Virginia. OK. Um, uh, my daughter-in-law, Barry Rafferty, Barry Friedman Rafferty, who is here with both of her beautiful sisters, um, asked to speak as well. Barry, who is the most successful woman in business I know, and, uh, and a great mother of two grandchildren of mine who just tickle the hell out of me, and uh, of which I am very proud. And, uh, and you heard David before. This is David's wife. And at any rate, maybe I ought to turn that around. David is her husband. <laughs> okay. <Or Stokely. laughs> All right. Well, it is one of those sad occasions, but also I think we all have amazing memories in our heart. And so I decided to write an ode to Donna. To all of you who knew her, she had a special flair. From her childhood days, she had looks that made people stare. She would say her looks peaked early, and then it came down to wit. For me, she was always engaging, 
and good for a laugh or a short quip. She entered my life when I met David, <coughs> excuse me, and visited the big city. She opened my eyes to an artistic world, and boy, did she create paintings that were pretty. Her loft was the coolest place I knew to hang out. Occasions and holidays there were filled with cheer and stout. She opened my eyes to different ways of thinking and seeing the world anew. Her and John were role models for us, for love and sharing different points of view. She is in our hearts and we all have great stories to share. My life has been enhanced by Donna's flair. She would have laughed at this ode, but enjoyed it as well. I hope she knows we are here to share memories and cathel. Thank you. Rebecca, I think it's time for you. Rebecca Kelly of the uh, eponymous Rebecca Kelly Dance Company. And uh, accomplishments too, low, too great to list. And uh, Donna's next door neighbor in across the hall lofts for what, 35 years? Something like that? Many. Many. <laughs> That's right, it couldn't possibly be long for you. Rebecca Kelly. <clears throat> so how do you put into just a few words, just a few moments, a whole life, a whole long life of laughter and love and happiness? We met Donna when she became our neighbor across the hall from our Soho loft in 1980. She was the painter, and we were the dancers. Our building at that time was filled with artists who were all fervently working on what they've become today. Donna and we celebrated each other's creative expressions for the next four decades through open studios, through exhibits, in dance and theatrical productions, in collaborations and in fashion and costume design product, projects, and over gourmet candlelit dinners with our husbands, and as well in afternoon pauses and hallway conversations. Donna brought a really lively sense of community to our loft building of very diverse artists. Throughout our daughter Hillary's early childhood, starting in the 1990s, we were so thrilled and thankful to have such funny, loving, and creative friends nearby where we could visit. Donna's unending creative explorations in art sparked so many conversations. We came to share and explore ideas and thoughts about art, art activism, art and politics, and especially about art in relationship to the environment and the human condition. Donna was always quick to respond, witty in words, swiftly and often wryly, morphing a political or social injustice observation into a painting. But she always beguiled the eye with her unique sense of color and form. I would say abstract narrative plus repartee. <laughs> Donna shared the abundance of her creativity with all who knew her. From the gift of a painting of zebras on an African veld at my daughter's birth, to the extraordinary expressions of her delight in butterflies, as we've heard, which later evolved into the most wonderful exhibit. In 2011 and in 2012, we collaborated on runway projects, Dan Design into Dance, where her canvases were showcased on the dancer models as wearable art. Some of you will remember Donna's memorable set designs and costumes for my ballet's Dream Driven and the painted fabrics for Tear of the Clouds and Wilderness Suite, and even hijinks. In 2013, Donna joined the board of Appleby Foundation. This is the nonprofit which governs the Rebecca Kelly Ballet and the Tahawa Center in the Adirondacks. Donna enlivened the board with her ready enthusiasm, her humor, and always her keen observations and her thoughtful stewardship. In this last decade, she fully understood our needs as mature artists to branch out 
beyond one's own Soho New York, New York City canvas. She was wholly supportive of the foundation's launch of a gallery and a dance studio and a host of film and music and STEM science activities in the rural area of upstate New York. Developing and maintaining the New York City to the Adirondacks conduit was one of the most exciting projects of Applebee's foundations in recent years. Her stunning group exhibit, Everglades in the Adirondacks, and the Artful Butterfly, which was at the Tahawa Center Gallery in 2015, was truly a coming together of many artists and many onlookers, pondering the beauty of nature and the sharing and responding to environmental concerns. Donna brought so much joy and delight and inspiration to each one of us here in this room tonight because she herself was filled with joy and delight. Through her creative acts and works and her vibrant friendship, she has contributed many beautiful moments in our lives. And because of her amazing creativity, she leaves us with such a tangible legacy of memories. Brian, <laughs> uh, another one of my family. Um, if you look in the corner in the back there, there was a whole bunch of them. Younger son, but the, the cadet. The younger son is the cadet, Brian Rafferty, who um, has uh, been my mainstay at the uh, Secular Humanist Society, the newsletter, Brian. Uh, formats it, lays it out for me, and uh, makes my words look good. And uh, had a special relationship with Donna, which I'll tell you about later when I take the uh, mic. Brian? Sure. Hi. Let us pray. <laughs> just, just. <laughs> <laughs> Dorothy de Borbo, Shirley Jean Rickert, Jean Darling, Edith Fellows, Mitzi Green, even Juanita Quigley. Who are these people? I really don't know. Uh, but ever since I was five years old, I've had to I've listened to Donna compare herself to every child star of the 1930s. <laughs> She would talk about one throwing a tantrum, uh, one being a no-talent hack, or generally how she was cuter than, more talented than, and uh, classier than her unfortunate Hollywood contemporaries. <laughs> Thankfully, she grew out of that phase and chose a career where personal ability, other people's taste, and success being based on being in the right place at the right time wasn't gonna be important. <laughs> she went into art. Of course, there are others who are more qualified to talk about all that. Uh, now, after that, there's a gap. There are tales of life on the boat, uh, an ex-husband, uh, uh, this and that going on, on until she met my father. And again, I can't vouch for what happened during that gap year, those gap years. I heard they were fun. Um, but as a slight aside, my parents split when I was, I'm the youngest. So my parents split. I was 18 months old. Uh, so I never had the same sort of sense of loss of something previous that my brothers had. Uh, to me, my dad shacking up with Donna, perfectly normal. <laughs> yeah, the, the fact that she baked and I love chocolate cake made things work out perfectly for us. Now, Donna had been a part of my life almost as far back as I can remember. It's odd to feel the void that I am sometimes surprised that she's left behind. I know that she made my dad happy every day even through their squabbles, but finding the love of your life is important, and it may not be your first love. Uh, it certainly wasn't for either of them, but it was the kind of love you read about. It was, and it is, the kind of love that set me down the path of seeking out that match for myself. I'm glad for all that Donna did for my father. She never really knew how to handle kids, and with him having four, there was certainly a learning curve 
Uh, there were times where you could tell that her quiet and demure attitude of not trying to be the center of attention was too much and she would <clears throat> occasionally uh, have to refocus a spotlight back on herself. <laughs> but they worked it out for each other. They found their balance. And now, my dad sits there on his side of the metaphorical teeter-totter by himself. And it's heartbreaking, because I know what he's feeling. I'm lucky enough to be married to the love of my life. Hi. <laughs> and I can't emphasize enough that I don't think I would have learned to look for that if not for Donna and how she made my dad feel. So for that, I thank her. And for that, I will miss her. And for that, I will always remember her. I've come to the end of my list. Is there anybody else who'd like to make a few remarks? Absolutely. Introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Deirdre Sinnott. Um, and I uh, remember, I'm sure a lot of people have probably been to parties up in Donna's loft. Uh, Donna had known my husband and I Charles for maybe a year, and um, we got engaged. Uh, now, Charles and I happen to be sober alcoholics who are atheists. And Donna went ahead and had a fantastic dry party for us at the loft, and I believe featured some of your chili. And it was just one of those wonderful things that you know, she just reached out and saw that, hey, wouldn't these two people really love to have a, have a party? You know, like, and, and I have a space for it. Um, I remember standing in Brooklyn at a, um, a mem another memorial, this for a young man who also happened to be an atheist, and there was this <clears throat> personage who uh, was there who had been brought in by his friends. He died very suddenly, it was very <laughs> mysterious. And so she said, I'm going to reach back into his Catholic past and, you know, talk about it from there. And we all stood there like, yeah. yeah. And Donna said to me, we have to do something so that we, uh, as atheists, agnostics, et cetera, can have our due without somebody. I don't want anybody reaching back into my Catholic past, I'll, t I'll tell you. Um, you know, Donna was a teeny tiny woman of substance, and she did not want to have to take any, uh, you know, um, what's a good word for it? Crap. Uh, and I learned a lot from her, and she would always, always come and focus on our conversations, and it was very important to me and very important to my growth, and I just will... Always miss her. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Deirdre. Uh, no, I was not. I, I will get to you. I was not at the end of my list. Where's Martine? Are you, are you going to speak? Sure. I, hope, I hope so. Because Martine is going to discuss a, uh, going to talk from her point of view of a something that was, you know, a part of her life which was very important to her for the last 18 years, including becoming your friend. I was hoping you had forgotten me, but you hadn't. <laughs> <laughs> so, I met Donna in 2005, I think. By then, I was already four years sober. Yes, Donna and I shared that, that we were two sober alcoholics. And when John asked me if I would say a few words, he said that he did not think Donna would mind ha having her um, anonymity broken. And I felt that for the occasion, I could break mine. So what? So 
at that time, I had been maybe three or four years in all kinds of AA meetings on Long Island, very religious AA meetings. And then suddenly I discovered there were uh, secular humanist agnostic meetings in the city. I had not known that, so I went, and that's where I met Donna, the first meeting I went. And Donna was immediately a great help. You know, alcoholics help each other, but more or less. But with Donna, she really immediately helped me because she had more experience than I did. I think she was already several years more than I did. And so that, our connection became very strong and very important to me. Throughout the years, sometimes I've had some questions. I know in the beginning I would ask something to Donna like, well, I haven't been drinking for a long time, but now I'm going to take a plane to go to Paris. Surely I can drink a little on the plane, right? <laughs> and she would say, no, <laughs> no, you can't. And you know, I knew she was going to say that. I just asked, you know, just in case. So. I'm very, very sorry that, you know, she was important to my life. And I, I got the phone call, I, I want you to know, it's, it's so unreal. I got the phone call on November 27th, I think. I was in, uh, in a hotel room in Rome, and my cell phone rings, and it is John. And I start saying, oh, wonderful. And then he says, Donna is dead. So she's dead, but not forgotten, not by me, ever. Thank you. Uh, like they used to say on old radio shows, there's a lady in the back <laughs> whose name has gone right out of my head. So I'll be very brief. I met Donna about. Uh, Eight years ago from friends I've known for many, many years, and coincidentally enough, I was in the gym of my building on 56th Street working out, and who walks in but Donna? And I'm like, you live here? And she's like, you live here? <laughs> and for years, we would meet at the gym every day, and she would come in with uh, comments on, you know, you all know, many, many, many things. But so we were at a, a family gathering, Donna was there, and my daughter was there, and at the time my daughter was, um, it's 2013, so eight and a half, and she has this little episode in the bathroom with my daughter. And a week later, I get a little card under my door, and I open it up, and there's a card, that says, hi, this is, um, this is because I had an actual conversation between Lily and me, we were in the bathroom, love Donna. <laughs> so she said, she gave me the poem, which is fabulous. The color code according to Lily. Miss Lily just gave me a lecture on the colors that little girls like. In this feminist session, I got the impression little boys' tastes could just take a hike. <laughs> she announced pink and purple. It, it don't matter what little boys think. With a look meant to demean brothers like blue and green, implying his opinion might stink. From the distance of age, I decreed that when they get to be men, men only like blue, scientifically true, and retreat to a colorless den. <laughs> and when they grow up, girls still like purple and pink. When I added red, should have just left that unsaid, because she ran off as quick as a wink. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Mark, uh, Donna's and my closest friends for 
many, many, many years were uh, uh, Herb Millman and Edith Finnell. And through them, we, we met both uh, Edith's, uh, both uh, um, Irv's two sons and, uh, and Edith's two sons and watched them from teenage or actually uh, even a little very early teenage until, Maybe my yeah. At any rate, um, Mark Fennell is here to say a few words. Thank you. Um, I didn't really expect to uh, say anything uh, this evening. I thought I'd listen to a lot of good stories, but uh, after hearing so many, um, I, I felt that there was one thing that I'd like to recount. And as John just pointed out, uh, my late stepfather, Irv Millman, and his wife, my mother, also the mother of Ron Fennell, and the son of Larry Millman, and uh, father-in-law to 80, all of whom are here this evening, um, we got to know John and Donna through many, many family events, holiday events, dinner parties, and the like. And I would say to, uh, to my mom, so who is going to be at this event? And when they would say among the guests would be John and Donna, I knew that we'd be in for a good evening. <laughs> and um, one thing that I, my mother was a particularly dynamic and interesting and uh, a woman. She had a lot to add to the conversation. She was interested in it. My mother could talk and charm a radiator. Um, but one thing about her was that she was never particularly funny. And um, not to say that she didn't have a sense of humor, she did, but she was not herself funny. But I noticed over the years, as the friendship between the two of them, my stepfather Irv and my mom, Edith, became closer and closer, my mother became funnier. <laughs> and she would always attribute, she'd come out with these one-liners and these zingers, and she'd say, that's a Marxism. And she, <laughs> She would just like, she, and she would be, she'd be like surprised and shocked in herself that she actually came out with it. It was like Donna had channeled herself to make this remark. And she would always give credit for years. She would say, that's a, that's a Marxism. And I, after a while, I'd say, Mom, you know, maybe it's like coming from you. It's not necessarily <laughs> from Donna. And she said, no, 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 no. That, that's, that's definitely right out of Donna's soul. And I said, oh. Okay, okay. And anyway, the point of that being that um, that was a personality trait that Donna brought out of my mother. And uh, it was a wonderful attribute that she retained for the remainder of her days. And um, it's a gift that uh, I always appreciate. And I love Donna for that. My granddaughter, Emma Rafferty, Brian's daughter, and um, just a terrific young woman. <laughs> um, so just to start out as a little fact, fortune cookies were not invented in China. They're not really Chinese. They were made up by Americans to go with takeout food. I have a little box that was painted by Donna with my initial on it that I keep every single fortune that I get. Because I like to look at them, and I like to see these couple words written by some person at a boring desk job, and I take that to be the meaning for something in my life. Donna Markser was not my grandmother by blood, but for all intents and purposes, she was my grandmother. 
she baked, she made amazing bunt cakes. My roommate has a bunt pin, and every time I make something in it, I think of Donna. And I have this picture. Um, I was about four years old, and I was painting with Donna. It was uh, an easel, which had a built-in set of paints, more colors of paint than I could count to at the time. Um, and I remember this moment painting with Donna, and I was painting a picture of my doll, and this was at the age when art was a stick figure that if she was wearing a blue dress, I'd color it in all in one color of blue. And Donna introduced to me the idea of coloring it in in several colors. This part is in shadow. This part, the light is hitting it. And that was probably the most dynamic painting I've done. I remember it was on... <laughs> not a very creative person. This may have been my peak at four. Um, but it, I remember that painting was on the wall of my room for a long time. Um, in that same room where that painting was done, we had a uh, piece by Donna of a tower against a sky, and through the window in the tower you could see a night sky. And I remember staring at that for hours, trying to figure out, because I didn't quite get it. Um, but, you know, we also, where I live now, we have a painting on the wall by Donna. Um, anytime I have a friend over, they can't decide if it's a painting of a peach or fire or something else abstract entirely. Um, but learning to look at something and see more than just the color of what it is, see more than, you know, this is a room with brown and white walls, to see beyond that, that was something I learned from Donna. I learned the depth of what there is in the world. I learned the depth of meaning in something that may not make sense. Um, and I think without Donna in it, the world does have a little bit less color. Bernie, and then this other gentleman. Bernie? About 10 years ago, was it? About 10 years ago, Donna said to me, you know the guy right on the corner of uh, Broadway and, and Houston who has the uh, stand and selling tchotchkes and he's got jazz on the portable radio? Uh, yeah, I think I sort of. She said, we go to lunch every Wednesday. <laughs> really? <laughs> okay. Um, well, lunch after a while became dinner with Donna and me, and Bernie Altman. <clears throat> Bernie Altman has become why one of my best friends as well as he was with Donna. Bernie? Hello, everybody. Hello. My name is Bernard Austin. John, my soul. my heart. Mama Donna, I call her Mama Donna because of a butcher shop. The man's name was Pino's Butcher Shop in Soho. We used to have brunch every Wednesday after her breakfast with the, uh, at Balthazar. Yeah, she used to go to Balthazar, then she'd come to me. <laughs> and we would have brunch. And we would go to Pino's. And, uh, and Pino is just very big. You know, he looks, he looks like what he is. You know, he looks tough. And he looked at me, and he was like, who are you? And Mama Donna said, that's my friend. And it didn't dawn on me what she was really saying. You know, this is, in my eyes, this was a very sweet lady that used to walk by my table. Then I used to put my hand in, the, in her back because I was protective of her. And she looked up at me one day and she said, Bernie, you know, don't do that. And I was like, why? She said, I'm not your caretaker. I'm your friend. I mean, I'm not her caretaker. I'm your friend. And I said, wow. I understood what she was saying. 
So we went to Pino's, and, and Pino's called her Mama Donna. <laughs> and to me, I understood that respect when somebody does that. I understand that. And um, from that day on, I used the word Mama Donna. And it, ro it rolls off my tongue. Yeah. She's not Donna Moxer to me. She's Mama Donna because she took a role that m my mother passed away and I wasn't there. And um, for some crazy reason, she took on that role. So we, every Wednesday we had brunch. And she would talk to me, she would educate me, she would teach me. So I understood, John didn't even know who I was. <laughs> uh, it was amazing. But when she finally, it was almost like she orchestrated the whole thing to me. She told me, Bernie, you didn't, you know, we're not friends, I picked you. So whatever she meant about that, I'm glad she brought me to her world because she educated me. She was there when I was really, really down. She was there. And uh, John, the Rapidy family, I fell in love with Mama Donna. Thank you. I am an innocent victim of alcohol. I swear it's totally innocent. And I want to tell you just a little bit of how that affected my life. I had an incident, totally innocent again, that sent me off to a detoxification camp in the Caribbean, founded by somebody called Eric Clapton. I had no idea who he was. It was paradise under the palm trees and the rhododendron. And up to the point of when you went through the rhododendron, you came up against a chain link fence, which was a bit of a shock. But this is not all about me, believe me. I'm going to get around to it. And so I went there for a month and came back chastened, if not completely cured. And one of, my, one of the stipulations that they gave me was that I had to go to an AA meeting, join a group. And I was humbled by that point, so I didn't uh, say no. So they sent me off, or I found a group in Brooklyn. And I lived on the Upper East Side somewhere. And I had no idea what an AA group looked like. So I came to this group overdressed. <laughs> and uh, my other vice is bird watching. And there is a bird in Costa Rica particularly called the resplendent quetzal, which indeed is resplendent. It's a very beautiful bird. And I walked into this meeting on a Saturday morning and although everybody was respectable looking, they weren't exactly resplendent quetzals, <laughs> except there was one <clears throat> bright, bright spot in the audience. And you can guess who that was. And she was beautifully dressed and smiling, and I was not at my happiest. And I sat down, and she came over and sat with me and patted me on the arm and said, I need you to help me dress this group up. <laughs> so <laughs> I said I would do my best. Uh, I stayed with that group for a year or two and then for a variety of typical alcoholic reasons, left the group and I lost touch with Donna but that one meeting with her and subsequent lunches and trips back on the uh, four and five train, I lived on the Upper East Side in those days, and I got very close to her and she was very good to me and she gave me inspiration. And I, I was pretty down in the dumps, as you, even after Eric Clapton's Paradise. <laughs> and uh, so I am 
eternally grateful to her for what she did to help me out. And she didn't know me at all, but she instantly put out her arms for me and I am grateful to have this opportunity to make it public. Thank you. Thank you, David. Okay. I guess I can't put this off anymore. First of all, thank you, of course, again, for being here. So many people have shared such wonderful memories of Donna with me in the past month. Olive Hackett Shaughnessy, who was inspired as a teenager decades ago by Donna, who was shocked to see and hear this tiny, vivacious burst of energy who was bold enough to create from within herself. Ollie became an artist and performer herself because of Donna. I see differently, she says, because of Donna's art. Carmen Elliott cherishes the memory of her neighbor and friend, Donna, decorating the roof of their East 18th Street building with a riot of paper flowers for Carmen and Russell's Tar Beach wedding reception in 1966, of making Carmen's first maternity clothes, and of painting a zodiac Aries for Carmen and Russell's firstborn, a little girl, in April 1970. So many me memories treasured by so many people of the artist, designer, activist, environmentalist, feminist, friend. But I want to talk tonight, not at great length, I promise, about the woman who was, who still is, the best half of Donna and John the feisty, funny, difficult, delicious woman I have loved and lived with for the past 43 years, and whom I will love as she demanded inordinately <laughs> until the day I die. Did the two pictures at almost the end of the slide presentation. One of Donna in a wet blue bathing suit and the other of a tussle-haired, sultry Donna vamping the camera. Did those break the elegiac mood of the presentation? <laughs> Did they seem a little out of place? <laughs> they were supposed to. I wanted to remind everyone, especially the overwhelming majority of you who have only come to know her in the last couple of decades. I wanted you to know that Donna Markser was not always a cute little old lady. <laughs> she was the most vital, life-affirming person I have ever known, and she was a great-looking, dynamically sexy chick who turned heads and stopped conversations when she walked into a room. Donna and I were, are, a love story. The gold standard, Maria Graber once called us. Wow, thank you. But our story didn't start with love at first sight, nowhere near. 
We knew each other for several years in the 1960s without being interested for three important reasons. Number one, we were both married to other people. Two, she thought I was a stuffed shirt. And three, I thought she was an airhead. <laughs> What's more, our first face-to-face -face conversation during those not interested years did not go well. Back then, I was the creative director of a small ad agency at which Donna did occasional freelance day work, mechanical paste-ups with paper and glue in those prehistoric days before computer graphics. One day, a client asked if I could make some simple changes to layouts I had just shown him. I said, sure, and took them back to the office. But it was lunchtime, and the only one in the art department was Donna, busy cutting and pasting. I explained to her what I needed and asked her to make a few simple pencil sketches. She said, no. <laughs> no. Luckily for me, before I could make some stupid remark like, wait a minute, I'm the boss, she explained. I don't do any creative work at these jobs, she told me, because she saved her energy for her real work her art, which she did at night. So the client had to wait a few extra hours, and I had to know Donna a few more years to understand that I had had my first lesson in understanding who this woman was first, last, and always, an artist, period. A few years later, when I was divorced and she newly separated, she worked for my fledgling business one evening, putting together a rush job presentation. Several hours alone together, followed by a drink together in the bar downstairs, and we changed our minds about each other. <laughs> we fell in lust. Early on, we called ourselves the odd couple because at first we were so seemingly ill-matched, even to ourselves. She, the always in motion overachiever who could not see a problem and give it a pass. And me, the laid back procrastinator who preferred to give any problem as much time as it needed to sort itself out. <laughs> Also early on, we were seeing each other regularly, but not exclusively. We were both wary of making too quick a commitment. In other words, we played it cool. Until one night, the dam, and dam near my nose, broke. It was a Friday night, we sat across from each other at Le Moal, an old-fashioned family-run white linen French restaurant that used to be around the corner from me on Third Avenue. As usual, we would, after dinner, spend the night together at my apartment. Then she would leave, and I would go out to Jackson Heights to pick up the boys for a Saturday and Sunday. But Donna had been casually dropping hints all week that she was going to Maine for the rest of the weekend with someone, the implication was clear. And even though I knew who it was, and she knew I knew, <laughs> I was expected to ask, with whom? <laughs> I would not. <laughs> I was cool. Through drinks, appetizers, and into the entrees, she kept referring to where we were going, and what we were going to do, I responded with comments about the wine and the bouillabaisse <laughs> until she punched me in the nose. <laughs> punched, not slapped, not smacked, not tweaked. She made a fist 
hauled off across the table and walloped me. Blood in the soup bowl. Donna, wide-eyed, horrified at what she had done. The owner and the maitre d' come running. Why is monsieur bleeding? Why is monsieur laughing? <laughs> and I did laugh. So did she. We both laughed all the way home, around the block, where sex happened. And I'm pretty sure that was the last time either of us ever played cool or played at all with someone other than each other. About Donna and my boys. The late 70s were a great time to be a single man in Manhattan before the plagues that were to come spoiled all the fun of this still new sexual revolution. I had a lot of fun Mondays through Fridays, but most of all, I loved my Saturdays and Sundays making a new family with David, Colin, Brendan, and Brian. And if the female interest of the moment asked, when am I gonna meet your kids? I lost their phone number until Donna. Donna had never wanted children, professed to have no maternal instincts. She'd always known, she said, that she couldn't be a mother and a professional artist at the same time. She made that choice. They have a mother, she said of my sons, and a Jewish mother at that. I can't be their mother what I can be is their friend, and she was. But she embraced the role of stepmother. She opened up my boys' lives to art and the theater, while she took a sneaky delight in being congratulated by strangers on her well-behaved children. <laughs> and she loved being the matriarch and the maestro of so many celebrations of friends and family in her Soho loft. She made my family our family. Know something, my sons, she loved you. David, her rock and her confidant, to whom she has entrusted her art legacy. Colin, who, when he first met her at age nine, asked, how do you feel about being a stepmother? <laughs> and to whom she has entrusted her and my last testament. Brendan, who so often tried her patience, but who's in <laughs> <laughs> And I'm getting the nine pound look right now. <laughs> but whose intelligence and wit never failed to dazzle her, and who so impressed her by becoming such a loving and successful father. And Brian, am I allowed to call you her favorite? <laughs> the five-year-old little boy who still baby lisped when he offered to buy one of her paintings. I have two dollars. <laughs> Pause. Maybe three. <laughs> How could she not love you? A collector. <laughs> the painting, Persephone's Gate, hangs in Brian's and Christine's dining room. And I have yet to see the three dollars. <laughs> Like all of us, Donna sometimes had regrets. Every once in a while, she would lament that she had never become an art star. When I was 25, she said, I was told you had to be 50 and have a penis. And when I was 50, I was told you had to be 25, 
with big tits. <laughs> but as the years went by, and the life we had together became richer, deeper, more and more loving, Donna was surprised by joy. I never expected happiness, she said, and thanked me many, many times for the happiness I brought her. She and I were never rich, but we had a rich and full life. Parties for a hundred or more at the loft on Christmas Eves. Picnicking in the gardens at Versailles and at Yeats's grave in Ireland. The once in a lifetime game six of the 1986 World Series at Shea. Dancing at Mardi Gras in Rio and in a Bastille Day parade on French St. Martin. A bicentennial year tour of colonial America with the boys. New Year's Eve's in black tie at the Rainbow Room, in the year of, in the year of Europe crowd on the Champs-Élysées, and at champagne and oysters just for two dinners at home. Reading poetry at the Players Club and hanging out with Jose Ferrar and Walter Cronkite. Conducting joyous humanist weddings together in Central Park and on the traffic island in the middle of Times Square. <laughs> Bear boat sailing in the Virgin Islands. Moonlight skip skinny dipping under the Temple of Poseidon at Sunion in Greece. And growing old together, more in love, more tenderly, needing each other more, and caring for each other more every year. Together, 43 years of becoming together, of completing each other. One more anecdote about that talent contest she supposedly won. <laughs> While it's true that she did win several, she only came in second in the Major Bowes contest. But what the, got the attention of the Paramount Picture Scout in the audience was the little girl with blonde ringlets who charged back on stage, stamped her foot, and demanded, I don't want the little silver cup. I want the big gold one. <laughs> in life, she got the big gold cup. I made her happy. And I am so happy I did. Thank you all. The bar is open.